Arthur, Arthur. Until my heart beat, beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. The rhythm of the freedom song. I can feel my heart beat. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. When I say yes to the beat in me, I say yes to the beat. I can set my spirit free. I can set my spirit free. When I say yes to the beat in you. When I say yes to the beat in you. I can see your light shine through. I can see your light shine
Good morning. I'm Reverend Ellen Quadgrass, and I am here in ministry co-leadership with Kirsten Hunter, our Director of Lifespan Ministry, and in shared ministry with all of you. I want to welcome you this morning to this place of connection and depth on this late spring, almost sunny day which also happens to be Father's Day and also happens to be the day before Juneteenth, our Juneteenth celebrations. Welcome to this time to come together and remember who we are, find meaning, find something fresh in ourselves and in each other. Welcome to all of you online. Welcome to all of you in the sanctuary. Welcome to this place that it is good to remember was built on land that was originally stewarded by the Penacook and Wabanaki nations, a people who did not cede this land and who, like so many native peoples in this country, continue to fight for justice and self-determination. On this day when we recognize our fathers and their fathers and their fathers before them, <clears throat> may we recognize the original ancestors of this land who are still here. And on this day, anticipating Juneteenth, may we recognize all those who have suffered injustice and celebrate the success of all who have worked and continue to work for its transformation. And on this day, as Unitarian Universalists, may we remember our values, our aspirations to bring justice, equity, and compassion to our daily lives and out into the world. Our theme this month, <coughs> excuse me, is delight. And I want to offer gratitude to everyone who is delightfully participating in worship this morning, including Myra Anderson as our worship associate, South Church Folk and Johnny Pfeiffer offering the music, and our Time for All Ages, which will be artfully woven together with our associate program recognition by Jen Del Deo and shared ministry members Martha Cunningham, Marty Waldron, and Laura Montville. Alice O'Trainer could not be here this morning, but she's in the mix. The chancel flowers have been given by the family of Kelly Davis, and there is, as always, a whole crew behind the scenes who make worship possible every week. Please note, after the children's story, all young people are invited to attend our delightful classes, religious classes downstairs, just follow Jen as she leads our youngest down the aisle and down the stairs. And everyone of every age is always invited to coffee hour after the service for treats and conversation. Please note assisted listening devices and large print hymnals are available in the back of the sanctuary. Please ask an usher if you need assistance. And please silence your cell phone if you have one with you. It is now time for some announcements. Good morning. We have a bunch today, so I'll try to go through them pretty quickly. Um, first, a lot of people have been getting emails asking for your um, help with buying gift cards or running errands for Reverend Ellen. She doesn't need those things. Um, <laughs> church staff get targeted all the time with um, scammers sending you emails. If you look closely, if you click on what the email address is, you can see that it's not our email addresses, but it looks like it might say Reverend Ellen Quagras or Jen Del Deo. Um, and those are, those are being problematic right now. There are a lot going out to members of the congregation. So if you get requests from any of us looking for gift cards or errands or any kind of thing like that, then um, know that it most likely is not accurate, and you can reach out to us directly, typing in our email addresses um, if you wonder if it's real. So just be aware of those. Um, tomorrow, we are hosting the Howard University Gospel Choir in collaboration with the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire for their Juneteenth celebration. 
concert will be at 2 o'clock, and tickets are available through the Black Heritage Trail website and will also be available at the door. There are lots of Juneteenth events being hosted around the city, so check out the Black Heritage Trail website for a calendar of events. Um, this coming Saturday, June 24th, is Portsmouth Pride. Um, there's information in your order of service about that, but the parade starts at noon. But if you want to walk to the parade with a South Church group, meet here by, by 1145. Um, or look for the South Church banner if you don't get here quite for 1145. Um, there will also be tabling at the post-parade Pride Festival at Strawberry Bank, um, which will host booths, performances, and more. Related to that, there will be a um, Pride celebration for LGBTQ folk and their allies held at Bob Vaccaro's house after church next Sunday, the 25th. Um, and so if you'd like more information about that, you can see Brad Landon, who has his hand up over there. Um, during social hour today. Next, the Spiritual Book Group is hosting a tour of the Sarah Orne Jewett House in South Berwick on June 30th at 2 p.m. and everybody is welcome. More information about that is in your order of service. And finally, also in your order of service, several members including Peter Somsich are part of the welcoming committee for the sailboat of peace called the Golden Rule which is in Portsmouth, June 21st through June 24th. The mission is to support abolishing nuclear weapons. The mayor will welcome the boat at 11 a.m. on June 22nd, and free tours will be available. Um, a community event will be held in Parish Hall next Sunday, next Saturday, excuse me, June 24th at 7.30 p.m., and will include members of the crew. Um, again, see your order of service for that. Thank you. Speaking of light, it's time to light the chalice. So as we light the chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you at home to light a candle wherever it is that you are. As Reverend Ellen said, this is, we are on the path of delight in June, that's our theme, and I light the chalice with these words from the Reverend Scott Taylor. This light, it dances, barely able to contain its delight, and it seems to want us to do the same. So this morning, May we let it lure us into letting go of the worries, of the stiffness that sets in after all the striving, of the myth that productivity alone gives us purpose. This garden of life we've been given is a playground. The weeding can wait, so says this delightful flame.
Now please stand if you are able and join me in reciting our mission statement, which is on your screen and in the order of service. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. <clears throat> my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. That was my dad's motto. It was benign. It wasn't about, you know, election denying or vaccines or anything like that. Just mundane facts of life. Um, we laughed about it, we rolled our eyes, but to be honest, my siblings and I, and I would guess some of you too, carry a bit of that in ourselves. How quick are we to believe things that fit in with our worldview and to dismiss things that don't? I have been thinking about my dad who died five years ago at the ripe old age of 98. <clears throat> he was a person full of contradictions. He worked really hard to provide for us. He was fun. He could also be difficult and argumentative. We might say arguing was his sport. He would change sides at the drop of a hat if you started to agree with him. <laughs> he was stubborn and opinionated, could be short-tempered, and at my mother's behest, he spanked us. But he was also kind and generous and endlessly curious about all kinds of things. He was, it would be easy to say, eccentric, which could be embarrassing to us for he retrofitted everything, including sandals, to his own specifications using masking tape. <laughs> but it was, in its own way, delightful. His don't confuse me with the facts approach to life served him in ways that brought him both satisfaction and frustration. It spurred him, long before wind power was a thing people in this country were talking about, to design in our tiny two-bedroom apartment a windmill but the blades were plywood, and it was too heavy to spin without a wind of biblical proportions. <laughs> but he was sure it would make him rich. It didn't. He was not a mathematician. In fact, he had no math education beyond what you learned in the 1930s in high school. But he spent the years of his 80s and 90s writing an academic paper to prove something or another about prime number pairs sending it to the heads of university math departments, hoping for his genius to be discovered and acknowledged. It was not, and that frustrated him. Since my mother ran the roost and I formed myself in opposition to her ideas, I have often thought that my dad had little influence on me, and I said that to Reverend Ellen recently. But influenced by Lori Bilby's question, what if, in her opening words last month, I challenged myself to think about this. What if my dad did have a big influence on who I am? What would that be? So I think it is mostly from him that I got the idea that I didn't need to follow a traditional path. The courage to talk my way into a job that I might not be trained for. The freedom to change careers when I got bored. My intellectual curiosity, definitely from him. That I'm standing here in front of you today, I think also had something to do with him too. Not that he was a worship associate or understood anything about Unitarian Universalism, but that he got involved in things that stimulated him, that he liked ideas, the big questions, that he stepped up, that he wanted his life to make a difference. Six in the gray hymnal, come thou font of every blessing.
right, we need some kid energy up here. I would like to invite all children and all youth and anyone who remembers how to be a kid in their hearts to come right up here. So our church is a community. And to me, a community is where everybody is involved, everybody is important. And I believe that is true here. And another thing about community is learning goes in all directions. So there are some places where people think that grown-ups teach kids, and that's where it ends. Or sometimes grown-ups teach other grown-ups. But it's really, really important to remember that kids also teach grown-ups, and kids teach each other. And I know that is true with all of you. I know every one of you, and I know you teach all of us a lot of things. I'm curious about what you think you teach us. Do any of you have an idea what you teach the adults in our community? Oh, you have no idea. Well, I'm going to teach you what you teach us. <laughs> or what you teach me, and I believe this is true for a lot of adults. I believe that you teach us how to have fun. It's a sad thing that a lot of grown-ups kind of forget how to have real joyful fun. And you kids are so good at that. And so it's helpful to remind us. Claire, do you know something you teach us? Help other people when they need help. Exactly. You're really good at being ready to help with whatever, whatever you can do. And that's something that I'm going to need from you in just a little bit. Um, you, teach, you teach joy. Sometimes you, you all are so awesome that sometimes even just being there and doing exactly what you're doing and being yourselves is amazing for the adults around you. And one part of that is because you remember how to be exactly yourselves. That's another thing that some adults forget. And you're, you help teach us how to remember that about ourselves. And so here at church, it takes so many people volunteering to do things. It takes actually every single person volunteering to do things um, to make our community strong and work and vibrant. And, um, and you do things all the time, too, some of those things that I just named. And in a minute, Laura and Martha and Marty are going to um, call up some adults who have been volunteering in this church in very specific ways, and we're all going to acknowledge that and appreciate them. And you all are good at this. Um, I, I hear all of you say thank you really often, and you're good at showing it. So I would love for some help from all of you in this process. And so one thing we'll need to do is to make some space because a whole lot of adults are going to come up. So we want to make sure that this aisle is clear. And I want you all to stay up here, but maybe, yeah, scooch a little so, so that the space right here is for adults because we want to be able to see you and we want you to help. So you need to go over to this side or this side near the pews, near the benches. And I would love to have three volunteers. I have different jobs. I would love to have three volunteers that will help hand out roses. So Claire and Scarlett and Wilder. So hold, hold on for a minute. Thank you. You will be the rose hander outers. And others, um, Renee, maybe you can pass these out. You will know what to do with these. And once those adults come up, you can use those. And everybody else, and, and all of you, um, take one of the things that Naomi has. But also, show your appreciation for the adults um, in the ways that you know how. So thanking them, smiling at them. You could give a pat on the back as they go by if you want, or a high five. But those, that tool that you have is helpful. And then... Um, when we're done, there's a basket behind Naomi that has something you could use, too. Okay, so 
my three rows hander outers. Could you please come over here? All right, and we'll, we'll get ready for this ceremony. Thank you, Jen, and thank you for all of these helpers. So today, we celebrate our South Church members who have served and will serve the church and our wider community in one of our associate programs, fellowship, learning, pastoral, social justice, and worship. These programs represent what many of us know to be shared ministry. This shared ministry is integral to our vision of collaboration here at South Church. These associate programs assist and amplify the work that Reverend Ellen and Kirsten do in ministering to this congregation. In a very real sense, the work of these associate programs is an extension of their ministry to each of us and our community. New members <clears throat> are asked to serve a two-year term and may elect to serve a second two-year term. Indeed, many of the associates who will be leaving their respective teams today served through the very difficult years of COVID. We have nothing but admiration for their commitment during this difficult period. As we call you up, please take a rose as a symbol of our appreciation for your service and stay in the front until all retiring continuing and new members are called. For the congregation, we'll have a time at the end for applause. And it is my delight to be able to thank the members completing their service um, and call them up. So fellowship associates, Ginny Sees, Jane Cavanaugh, Connie Frymuth, Catherine Greeley. Learning Associates, Brian Murphy, Arthur Eaves, Kirsten Vernon. Pastoral Associates, Jenna Coins, Kim Rivest, Donna Waldron, Martha Ammon. Social Justice Associates are very committed. There are none leaving this year. <laughs> Worship Associates, Myra Aronson and Laura Bilby. Please come up so that we can say thank you. We appreciate your service. Those continuing in fellowship associates are Tracy Lipset, Jan Marston, Kevin Leahy, Dot Mason. Continuing in learning associates, Valerie Fagan. For pastoral associates, Martha Leaf and Donna Melillo. Social justice associates are a very committed group. Robin Schnell, Janet Pulaski, Jackie Ellis, Kathy Wolf, and Deanna Strand. Hmm? <laughs> I won't play favorites. Worship associates. <laughs> Anna Howard, very committed, Lisa Massio, <laughs> Rhett Newberry, Willow Young, Hillary Clark, and Ray Strand. All our associates are very committed. And in shared ministry, um, Marty Waldron, Martha Cunningham, and Alice O'Trainer. And I forgot to mention, Laura Montville will be completing her term um, this spring. Getting a little congested up here in a very delightful way. <laughs> We're also pleased to welcome new associate members. For fellowship associates, Kim Rivest, Carol Pivor, Donna Waldron, and Myletta Ng. Some of those folks are actually moving from one associate program to another associate program. For learning associates, Amanda Donovan, Peter Jarrett, Ann Sherpik, and Mary Bannock. For pastoral associates, Greg Birdwood, Terry Carnan, 
Kathy Catherine Greeley, Carlo Natoli, Cindy Brown, and Nancy McLean. Social Justice Associates, Anita Rosef, Tess Feltes, and BJ Lates. Worship Associates, we don't have any new members for Worship Associates this year. Not yet. Those are the operative words. And if Myra's dad was here, he would probably say, I'm sure that some of you are so delighted to see this enormous group of fun people up here that you might get inspired. And if you do, please don't hesitate to reach out to a shared ministry member or a worship associate member or Reverend Ellen or Kirsten, if you are curious and would like to learn more. Shared ministry new member this year is Rebecca Blake. We're so delighted to recognize all the people who do the work of these programs. Churches, just like raising children, it takes a village. So if you'll join me in clapping and applauding all these wonderful folks. <laughs> you got a few more, there you go. Thank you, everyone. And now we're going to sing the children downstairs, and we're going to sing the grown-ups to their pews. week at the offertory, we combine our resources to support South Church, the building, staff, congregants, and the greater community. In support of the greater community, this month the collection will be shared with the Immigrant Support Fund, which provi provides direct financial and housing support to immigrants and refugees in our communities, advocates for immigrant-friendly policies, and connects immigrants and refugees with other support services. You can donate in many ways. You can use our mobile app, Vanco. You can give via the donate link on our website or by sending a check in the mail to our office at 73 Court Street. Or you can put something in the collection plate, which will be coming down shortly. <clears throat> the offering will now be gratefully received. And in the words of the Reverend Kayla Parker, may we give in love and in hope.
Yeah, you said it. <laughs> In this time of community holding and prayer, I want to let you know that Alice Timmons shared with me that her partner, Margaret, had a fall last weekend and is at home with a broken wrist and maybe broken ribs. Please hold both of them in your thoughts. Alice said to me they could use some prayers, some strength, and some communal thoughts. Let us gather our hearts and minds in a spirit of prayer or meditation. God, spirit of life and love, source of our joys and comforter in our trials, may we be with one another in our difficulties in the so many ways that those appear in our health and well-being, struggles with work or money, loss of someone we love or troubles in our relationships. May we bring compassion to our hardships and offer care to one another as we witness what others are facing. And even in the sadness, there is always some opportunity for joy. Savoring laughter among friends, moments of inspiration that fuel our passions, the taste of a delicious meal shared with people who we love. There is good in the world, always. May we not lose connection to life's delights. And as we anticipate Juneteenth, may we reflect on the journey toward freedom and justice. May we honor the struggles and triumphs of those who fought against slavery and oppression. May their courage and determination inspire us in our commitment to dismantle systems of injustice and in the ongoing work of creating a society where all people are free and truly equal and valued. In this time, let us hold each person's joys and sorrows as well as the larger context and the meaning of Juneteenth. May our prayers and thoughts be a source of strength and compassion as we honor the past, embrace the present, and work toward a future where all people can flourish and thrive. Amen. In this moment, made sacred by our presence and our prayers, I invite you to light a candle for whatever joy or sorrow you have in your heart. As the music plays, please come forward. And please remember, if you are going through a difficult time personally, please reach out to me or to Kirsten or to the pastoral associates if you need us. There is a card in the pew that you can fill out and place in the basket on one of these tables or come and find me or one of us after the service. We are here for you. I now invite you to light a candle for a joy or sorrow you are holding today.
some years ago. There's a reading right now, not years ago. There's a reading right now. Some days ago, Ellen asked me to do this reading before the sermon. <laughs> Shifting the Sun by Diana de Havinician. <laughs> When your father dies, say the Irish, you lose your umbrella against bad weather. May his son be your light, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the Welsh, you sink a foot deeper into the earth. May you inherit his light, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the Canadians, you run out of excuses. May you inherit his son, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the French, you become your own father. May you stand up in his light, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the Indians, he comes back as the thunder. May you inherit his light, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the Russians, he takes your childhood with him. May you inherit his light, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the English, you join his club you vowed you wouldn't. May you inherit his son, say the Armenians. When your father dies, say the Armenians, your son shifts forever and you walk in his light. Some years ago, a colleague of mine had a baby. The first words out of its mouth were, Abba, which was very exciting to her because Abba is the Aramaic word for father, used in the Bible for God. It was a sign to her not only of her baby's budding linguistic capacity, but also of its deep religious sensibilities. Her partner was excited too, because ABBA also happens to be the name of a fantastic Swedish rock band from the 70s. <laughs> and inciting their name is an omen for a child's excellent musical taste, as well as its promising fashion sense. From my own perspective, as a minister who also happens to be a huge ABBA fan, I would be excited, period. But the story evoked in me this question. How do our early experiences shape us? And in particular, because this is Father's Day, what was the impact of the hopes and expectations of our fathers and father figures? of who they are, their strengths and weaknesses, their presence or their absence. Have we followed in their footsteps or followed anything but? And then the key question for me, what does that all mean for who we are becoming now? I had the privilege of posing some of these questions to 15 associate program members who were coming on, rolling off, or somewhere in between in the lead up to today. I was so curious to hear something about who their fathers were and how that person might still live in their decisions and activities, how that intersects with how and why they are serving here at the church with their passions, inspirations, what is moving them or blocking them now. And if that sounds like a lot for the 15-minute Zoom calls I had scheduled with them, it was. So thank you all for going longer than 15 minutes. But I was grateful for every one of those conversations, which I found heart-opening, sometimes heart-wrenching, definitely inspiring. If I had time to talk to more of you, I would have. I'm grateful for the permission they gave me to share with you some of what they shared with me, beginning with something about their fathers. Who are these people who raised you? 
One of you told me you loved your father and witnessed his struggle to become a better person. But you also witnessed his struggle with bipolar disorder, which he self-medicated with alcohol. And so he often could not be a good role model or show you what a nurturing, attentive parent was like. Your father died at 53 because his body was taken up with illnesses. You told me you were barely in your 20s at the time. One of you shared that your father was kind and wise and you adored him. When he died in your early teens, you tried to take over his role for your younger siblings. You still wonder whether that was a good idea but the memory of your father inspires you, even now. One of you told me what a warm and generous man your father was. He'd been a physician all his life, and when he passed away, someone gave you his accounting books. You learned that when a family could not afford his services, he accepted payment in eggs. You married someone just as generous as he was, you told me, and feel like the luckiest woman in the world. One of you shared that your father was preoccupied with work and struggled to be emotionally pre pre present. These days, you call him, but he will forget to call you back. That hurts, you told me. But you married someone very different from your father, and you feel incredibly lucky now. And one of you told me your father was not a good father. He didn't work hard. He was insecure and exaggerated so excessively it was almost to the point of lies. And after your mother left him, when you had to have an eye operation at the tender age of 14, when your mother did not come visit you in the hospital, when you were disoriented, not knowing if it was night or day, there he was at your bedside just when you needed him most. I wish I had time to share with you all the details of all the stories. There was so much there. But each of you here also has your own story. Sometimes our fathers have been our umbrella, like in the poem Myra read, or some father figure of any gender was there shielding us, caring for us, protecting us. Sometimes our father's umbrella had holes where the rain came through. Sometimes our fathers were so blown inside out by the storms of their own lives, they were hardly able to be there for us. How have these experiences shaped us, formed us, molded us? Where do we go from here? My dad was not perfect, but great in lots of ways. Still, his umbrella could not protect me from everything. I've talked before about moving around a lot as a kid. For some people, that makes them gregarious and friendly. For me, it made me self-conscious and like I wanted to hide behind a couch, which I did growing up at least once literally and on multiple occasions figuratively. Unfortunately, hiding behind a couch literally or figuratively has not always served me well. In my later life, it led me to get stuck hiding behind a screen, stuck behind my fear, stuck behind a certain image I wanted to project. I don't even always realize the ways that I get stuck in some old mold until something is gently brought to my attention where I'm like, oh yeah, there it is, that old feeling, that old belief, that old way of being. Like, 
for example, when Alice O. Trainer, who gave me permission to sh tell this story, shared something about the search process during the installation team celebration lunch a couple of weeks ago. As part of the search team's due diligence, she told us, the team did some extra research on each candidate, including watching some sermons beyond the ones the minister had meticulously hand-picked for submission, because, you know, you never know. I leaned in to hear what she might say about these sermons that I had not carefully selected. Sometimes a little formal, she said, mentioning the robe I regularly wore at my last church. Would hope if we bring her here, she loosens up a little bit. She paused, I held my breath, and then, turns out we didn't have to worry, she finished, laughing. When I relayed that story to a small group a few days later, someone piped up that he likes to tell people his new minister bleeped herself in one of her very first sermons here. <laughs> and while bleeped swearing in the pulpit may not be the path to freedom for everyone, and while I know I am not and will not be relaxed all the time here or anywhere, the truth is that for me, choosing ministry has been partly about changing an old story, breaking up, breaking out of an old mold, stepping out from behind that couch. And coming to South Church has been an invitation to loosen up and try some new things or do old things in different ways. I was witnessing among associates I talked with, how they were using their present day choices, their lives, their relationship with South Church to knock the edges off beliefs and habits that were not serving them. Like the person who told me their father wasn't a good role model, who's been retooling everything about fatherhood from the inside out with his own kids. Or like one woman who told me that she was sad her father wasn't there for her emotionally growing up. He's not coming, she'll realize again in the present. But then the next thought she has is, but you are. You're here, she says to herself. And she is someone who I have witnessed showing up emotionally for herself and for other people here and beyond South Church in all kinds of ways. And there was another man who said that while his male cultural training is to take charge, sometimes my role is to not step in and do something, he said, but to step in and listen. These days, he said, he sees every engagement as a growth opportunity. There's this awesome quote attributed to Michelangelo that goes something like this. He did not sculpt his glorious statue of David. What he did was chip away at the solid block before him revealing the magnificence within by removing chip by chip everything that was not David. Amen. Church can be a place to knock the edges off. Whether serving as an associate on a finance committee, sharing at a covenant group, or walking up to someone you do not know at coffee hour, in fact, there's a fabulous book that talks all about that, in particular how serving in a church can knock the edges off, be a spiritual practice, grow us, teach us, reshape us. It's called Serving with Grace by Eric Walker Wickstrom. Your shared ministry team has been talking about it, and I see many of you already living it. 
taking lessons from everyday, day-to-day interactions right here, the good and the bad, and recognizing them as all part of the path. The transcendence of the most sublime covenant group share, as well as the overflowing compost bin downstairs or that upset committee member. I like that perspective because, in spite of this being the month of delight, some of you may already know that not every moment of every meeting of every associate group or any group in any church is always delightful. (laughs) Not every interaction, every experience, and every person is transcendent all the time. The reality is we are all mid-sculpture We are all only partially carved out. Even spiritual luminary Thich Nhat Hanh, when someone would tell him how wonderful he is, would respond, well, you're partly right. There is a term, namaste, that some people say in some circles, which I've heard translated as, the light in me sees the light in you which is nice, but it implies a flip side that sometimes the non-wonderful in me sees the non-wonderful in you, and that doesn't always feel as good. It is the kind of experience that Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron calls the big squeeze. When the ideals of who I want to be or who I want you to be, do not match the reality. When we have the aspiration to wake up and help, she writes, but at the same time, it does not seem to be working out on our terms. It's the kind of thing that usually makes us want to run away, she writes, and give up the whole thing. But it is also one of the most productive places, she says, in the awakening of the heart. Being caught in the big squeeze humbles you, she says, and at the same time, it has great vision. It softens you, and yet it has a big perspective. In other words, when life squeezes the shape we currently are, it doesn't necessarily feel good, but it's not always bad. In fact, maybe, It's essential. Because, after all, if chasing only pleasant experiences led to enlightenment, our whole world would look very different right now. We have all been shaped by something, someone, by beautiful ideals or by the lack of them. Whoever our fathers or father figures have or have not been, here we are. Whether they were more wonderfulness or not so wonderfulness, here we are together now. I love the sentiment of the woman who said, He's not coming, but you are. He wasn't able to be present, but you can be. And I love the last line in the poem Myra read that said, when your father dies, your son shifts forever. When your father dies, or maybe when your illusion of your father dies. Perhaps your son can shift forever. And what if, whatever the past has been, the light can still be freed to take in and share right here, right now, imperfectly in our learning and growing, struggles and potential, potential, in all the ways we are still mid-sculpture, in all the ways 
we are already right here, visible in our magnificence. I want to close with something I experienced at the top secret coming of age wilderness journey that we heard mentioned at the service last week. Jen Deldeo gave me permission to share a little more of what actually happened. After our youth were sent off for into the wilderness for their time of deep reflection, time by themselves to wonder, meditate, and imagine after they came back, talked about it, processed it, and importantly, had lunch. After that, there was a very special ceremony, a ritual, the ritual, in which these young people actually cross over formally that threshold from child to youth a ritual that marks the shift from who they have been to who they are becoming. This was the moment they step across the line. Among the words they were invited to say were these, I now take responsibility for my relationships. I now take responsibility for my own decisions. Thank you for supporting me. And as I listened, I thought, oh, I need to make that commitment. Maybe I need to make it every day. I need to take responsibility for my relationships again. I need to take responsibility for my decisions again. And getting support, oh yeah, need to do that every day. As part of this ritual, we sang a song that went something like this. And we started by doing this. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. When I say yes to the beat in me, I can set my spirit free. When I say yes to the beat in you, I can see your light shine through. I can see your light shine through. We have all been shaped by something for good or for ill, but there remains deep inside a heartbeat, a rhythm, our true self to which we can always say yes. May we continue to free ourselves from has not what has not served us and open to the light of what can. May we say yes to the beat, yes to each other, yes to our light and our freedom song, and let us sing together. I can feel my heart beat. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. I can feel my heart beat. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. When I say yes to the beat in me, when I say yes to the beat in me, I can send my spirit free. I can send my spirit free. When Feel free I to rise. When I say yes to the beat in you, when I say yes to the beat in you, I can see your light shine through. I can see your light shine through. 
can feel my heart beat. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. I can feel my heart beat. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of the freedom song. When I say yes to the beat in me, I say yes to the beat in me, I can send my spirit free. I can send my spirit free. When I say yes to the beat in you, I say yes to the beat in you, I can see your light shine through. I can see One more time. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of a freedom song. I can feel my heart beat. Beating to the rhythm of a freedom song. When I say yes to the beat in me, I can send my spirit free. Beat in you. I say yes to the beat in you. I can see your light shine through. I can see your light shine through. Amen. So we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Let us feel the rhythm, say yes to the beat, choose light, share light, and may we dance.
Never. Uh, on one and three. 